Here to present their research, please welcome Mark Lambert, Jamie Gerbrecht, Neil Nunez, Michael King, Chuck Meese, and Robin Mickelson. Good day to you. I am Jamie Gerbrecht, Principal Construction Engineer with ExxonMobil, and I'm joined by Mark Lambert of Eastman, Neil Nunez from Bechtel, Michael King of Black & Veatch, Chuck Meese from Autodesk, and Robin Nicholson of ConstructX. We're happy to present our research by first covering background information, then our data collection efforts and findings, and finally, the concierge of AWP barriers and solutions that we've developed to support companies in applying AWP. Our research team set sail on this journey to promote AWP use in early 2019 after prior research identified AWP as an essential initial element for safely improving productivity and highlighted AWP barriers resolution as a key next step. To initially frame our opportunity and problems, we reviewed some of the latest information on the actual AWP return on investment being demonstrated on projects. Not the projected return, but the actual return on real projects. In the 2019 Houston AWP conference, an expert panel on what's in it for me collected and shared feedback from owner and EPC companies on the return that they're actually experiencing from applying AWP fundamentals on projects. And here's a selection of what they shared. Starting on the left, I'll mention just the items in bold font, but you can see the others as well. For safety, an owner company shared that an AWP project had outstanding safety performance with a TRIR of 0.00, while an EPC company indicated that they experienced a reduction in safety incidents. For productivity, an owner experienced a 25% improvement in field productivity, and an EPC similarly reported up to approximately a 25% increase in productivity of some craft. In the cost category, an owner had an 11% cost underrun, and an EPC saw up to 15 to 18% improved cost performance. And under schedule, an owner reported the actual schedule being six months less than forecasted, while an EPC also saw a reduction in the construction schedule. And finally, in quality, owners reported stellar quality performance and reworked less than 1%. And an EPC experienced up to a 50% reduction in non-conformance reports. Mark? Thank you, Jamie. Now let's consider a few specific examples of actual project successes. From the Shell Tiger Alpha Olefins AWP implementation in Geismar, Louisiana, which included 360,000 linear feet of pipe and 23,000 pipe spools, over 4,700 tons of steel and over 600 pieces of equipment. The project demonstrated excellent productivity across all major disciplines and showcased the possibilities of real-time material status reporting. Consistent, constructible work packaging achieved. To an Eastman example, where we're working on specific project implementation, but also working to build the fundamentals of workplace planning and improving AWP maturity on a site project portfolio basis. This work, along with other efforts, has shown impact on improved trends in safety performance. Total construction injury cases have been reduced over time. Again, there's always a strong argument for continual improvement during front end loading and for better planning during construction. Uh, these are key AWP principles. And then thirdly, to an ExxonMobil example, uh, 
the Beaumont polyethylene expansion project completed in 2019 had 88% of its engineering work packages issued on or before target dates. Very good performance. From actual case studies, let's transition to our recent research. We discussed examples of how AWP has truly worked well. Now we see our research, recent survey results from the industry. The data indicates the number of company respondents. The RT365 survey data includes both CII and non-CII members surveyed on project characteristics of their AWP implementation. It may have been perceived earlier that full AWP is only applicable for the mega project. However, in looking at current projects, this is no longer the case. There's an even distribution from mega projects to small projects less than $100 million. If you consider the principles of early engagement with the full project team, including construction and the emphasis on good planning techniques, it makes sense that AWP should be just as applicable for the $5 million project as it is for the $5 billion project. Our research also captured data on project location. As shown, companies are introducing AWP into projects not only in North America, but across the globe. As more owners begin implementation and require AWP as the project work process, I believe we'll see continued growth and adoption from the EPC and supplier communities. As safety performance is the ticket to play from the owner, advanced work packaging will also be a requirement now and into the future. And many owner organizations are already beginning to require use of AWP fundamentals as part of their project work process through their engineering and construction contracts. Jamie? Thank you, Mark. So in summary, the AWP ship has left the dock. And if you are not fully on board yet, the goal of this research team is to get you to the ship, knowing that if you implement AWP reasonably well, it should touch and improve many aspects of your projects. So where is your company today on the AWP implementation journey? We've generally described four levels here, and we would like for you to consider which of these best describes your company's current level. Level zero, not yet implementing AWP. Level one, just initiating the AWP journey. Level two, developing and applying AWP processes and procedures. And level three, you have an integrated AWP program implemented on most projects. So now, remember which maturity level best describes your company as Mark shares related data from our research. The original CII research explains the maturity model in implementation resource 272. The model is included along with many supporting resources. Our research team, RT365, also assessed overall maturity of owners and contractors through the surveys. The combined results are shown for AWP maturity levels one through three in the categories of the company's view of AWP, AWP implementation strategy, the company's work process to support AWP, available training within the company, and finally, company culture. Notice the good overall score on view of AWP. Yeah, this is encouraging for the industry. However, also note the lower maturity levels in the strategies and work processes to support this view. Uh, there's still work to remove the barriers to raise these scores. Through the surveys, we confirm that some, some companies are on the journey, but are struggling through the various challenges and barriers that exist. So our team turned our focus to identifying and overcoming the barriers. Jamie? And this effort toward identifying and overcoming current AWP barriers is intended to further promote AWP use for better navigating the journey of executing a project and achieving valuable benefits 
across the six performance dimensions shown here. Safety, productivity, cost, predictability, quality, and schedule. Thanks, Jamie and Mark. As described, AWP has several benefits, schedule, cost performance, safety, and it's been successfully deployed on several projects. Yet we still find that the industry is not broadly yeah, implementing AWP. The industry is not broadly so implementing next, AWP. Michael will take us through our so process next, to understand what the barriers are to implement AWP in our industry. Michael? Thanks, Neil. Uh, starting uh, from the left, we'll talk a little bit about our research goals. And the research team strategy was to use that common reference point of the AWP maturity model from RT272 that identifies certain aspects of implementation, the view of AWP, the process training and deliverables, support, et cetera, to, to help frame up the conversation. This allowed the identification of the barriers and solutions specific to each aspect of AWP implementation, in addition to addressing the differences between the low, medium, and high maturity companies. And uh, the other target of the research was once it was complete, how could we promote uh, the use of the knowledge? Our research was divided into two phases. Uh, phase one included surveys and follow-up interviews about AWP maturity and barriers and solutions. Uh, that report uh, was dated March 2020, uh, was recently issued by CII. And phase two included additional interviews and the qualitative analysis of the information. Further, as the phase one interviews identified a key barrier uh, that shaped how the team thought about the phase two deliverable. Um, participants revealed during the interviews that even companies that possess the book knowledge of AWP still struggle to apply that information to projects. Uh, interviewees mentioned that there's plenty of resources to support AWP implementation, but finding those resources is sometimes difficult. So we had to look for a different approach to delivering and sharing that information from this research project. This led to the concierge tool uh, that Chuck will discuss uh, later on. Uh, for those companies that provided the feedback uh, to this research project, uh, thank you. We really wanted to hear feedback uh, from you about what implementation looks like, the barriers encountered, and your solutions to overcoming those barriers. Um, if you look at the right side of the screen, you'll see some of the barriers that were identified by your peers through this research project. Perhaps some of those are familiar to your own experience. The qualitative analysis part of the research identified where those barriers were most likely to occur in an organization or in a project. And we group those responses that contain the same idea, but you know, possibly worded a little bit differently. For example, poor integration of engineering and AWP and untimely vendor information would relate to an engineering topic. Another barrier example, poor understanding of AWP and difficulty accessing recent data would relate to a resources and technologies category. With that brief introduction to the research goals, approach and deliverables, um, let's start to look at some of the findings. Neil? Thanks, Michael. For the next section, I'd like to talk you through what the key findings from this research were and how we approached the solutions to addressing these barriers. When we started studying the barriers collected, we realized there was a relationship between the AWP maturity levels of the companies and the themes of the barriers presented. Those companies that were of low maturity were really still trying to understand how they could apply AWP and how it would provide a benefit to their business. 
they weren't so much looking to implement it, but just justify its use in their company. Those companies of media maturity understood the benefit of AWP. They recognized that there was a relationship between a successful AWP implementation and improvements in cost, schedule, certainty of outcome, and safety. But they're still struggling to understand the methodology and how to incorporate AWP processes into their management systems. Further, they understand the need for qualified AWP resources but are just starting their journey to seek and incorporate these resources capable of applying AWP in their business. And finally, those companies of high maturity understand the benefits. They understand the process and have been able to integrate and modify their company processes to deploy AWP, but are approaching the limits of engineering coordination, resulting in impacts to key engineering deliverables and data that enable a successful AWP deployment. When we started looking at the themes in the solutions that address these barriers by maturity, we started to see that they grouped into actions that we could take as an industry that would positively impact people, process, and technology implementing AWP. For those of low maturity, the solutions focused to change the company culture to allow for AWP success. For those of medium maturity, it's all about process definition. There's a tremendous amount of content available that defines how AWP could and should be deployed on a project and in a company. The solutions are about being able to process and implement that content. Finally, for those of high maturity, where they have a sense of what they need to do and are bought into AWP, the solutions focus on optimizing interfaces across their organization and leveraging technology to facilitate information and data exchange. Now I've shared with you the themes, but there's a lot more depth in our research that we'd like to share. Michael and I will share with you four specific examples. The first example is integrating with engineering. There are many bullets listed here, but if we were to summarize, we would see that the first solution theme is the assignment of an AWP champion within engineering, a single point of contact that the team could reach back to for guidance. Further, this champion is an advocate of the program for the project and the company, a catalyst for culture change. Second, plan the engineering interfaces when engineering and construction are separate contracts. This ensures we memorialize the right information at the right time by the right owner. Some of the barriers restraining engineering from supporting AWP related to not understanding the technology or tools that facilitate an AWP process. Establishing a training program that is relevant to these tools and the end user of those tools was found to be an effective method in increasing adoption. Finally, there were several suggestions and solutions where companies were able to address the engineering barrier by forming a collaborative contract where they motivated, incentivized, or compensated engineering contractors for deliverables and the data required to apply AWP. Next, Michael will take us through another solution. Hey, thanks, Neil. In this barrier case, it's a lack of organizational alignment that's impeding AWP implementation. So again, we see an AWP champion like we did with the integration with engineering. However, this one has some broader goals as we're talking about an organization. And you may find that you need several champions depending on your company structure and culture. Some of those solutions also arise such as driving stakeholder engagement at that department level, since we're talking about an organization again, not a project ensuring those strategies are, are fit for purpose and make sense not only at the department level, but can support project specific needs later on is very important. For example, the CII RT272 includes a detailed set of project flowcharts that depict typical processes as practiced by an owner, project management, construction management, supply chain, et cetera. And it includes a, a set of functional job descriptions 
specific to AWP to support the staffing of AWP processes. Those examples provide a good foundation to build from, but you need to review them and refine them to meet your specific needs and make them fit for purpose. Also, the solutions need to include a feedback loop, a means for the stakeholder to periodically assess how things are working and adjust accordingly. Uh, nobody gets it right the, the first time. Neil? Thanks, Michael. Next, we will review solutions to improving AWP understanding. This relates back to those companies that are of medium maturity and understand the benefits, but are still working through the institutionalization of AWP in their company. If you look at the solutions collected, the first summarized to establishing roles and job descriptions that incorporate the AWP core competencies. In some cases that included creating new roles, and in some cases that included rolling AWP roles into existing or current project roles. The next solution focused on consolidating and organizing the content available into a condensed playbook that provided just the direction that was needed based on the role and the project phase. Companies that improved AWP understanding went beyond a project level AWP approach and into a program approach where companies applied it across several projects, enabling an environment of increased learning for those applying it. Finally, Companies that apply AWP at a program level established knowledge areas or dedicated working groups where AWP practitioners and experts could come together to trade lessons learned. Michael? Thanks, Neil. So in this barrier case, the company is not convinced of AWP benefits. Uh, therefore, they're not moving forward with implementing this CII best practice. So some solutions uh, that uh, uh, the industry uh, noted was scalability, is that you can scale AWP for small projects or portions of large projects. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, the Scalable Advanced Work Packaging Report Best Practice Guideline from the Construction Owners Association of Alberta in May of 2019 provides some insight for implementing those key a AWP principles and practices in a, in a scalable application. Um, review your company's execution results was another solution. You know, how did we do on safety, quality, predictability? Could AWP help with a focused effort to improving one or more of those results? And how could AWP be implemented as part of your company's continuous improvement program? The CII RT319 the summary noted that a key finding was that even initial implementation, i.e. projects with low maturity, garner significant benefits from AWP. At the same time, those benefits increase as AWP implementation matures, which then supports you know, further investment. And finally, take a look at the industry case studies webinars, presentations, et cetera, you know, how do they apply to your business? We just quickly discussed four barriers and solutions, and though we did not go into every bullet, you may have recognized some common items, picked up some names of CII and COA research projects, and started to get more curious about how your organization or project may implement AWP. So next, Chuck uh, and Robin will provide some more insight about the concierge tool to productize the knowledge from this research project and make it more accessible to you. Well, Michael, thank you for the introduction. As we've heard so far in the presentation, Jamie and Mark talked to you about the business value with return on investment on real projects. Neil and Michael just walked you through four barriers that we found and how we approached the solution to those barriers. What Robin and I are going to walk you through in the next section of the presentation is the tool that we've created to address those barriers and provide you the opportunity to be successful with AWP within your organization. As we worked through our research, what we quickly understood was there was a tremendous amount of information that was already available in industry that could be used to help 
organizations such as yours solve their AWP barriers. What we needed to do and what we approached with the AWP concierge was how do we create a link from this need to promote and enhance the use of AWP to all of the information that already existed in industry. So what we undertook was a process where we looked at five individual steps that we were going to use to create the AWP concierge. The first step was to identify all of the relevant references that we found out in industry. These were both CII and non-CII data, and they included reports, case studies, and conference presentations. Once we had identified all of the potential rel relevant references, we then looked at what are the references that we felt could be classified and used as solutions to some of the barriers that we had identified. We then took the opportunity to map those documents that we felt were relevant to the individual barriers and potential solutions as we developed the concierge. We then use that to populate what we refer to as a barrier card, which I'll show you in a little bit. And once those barrier cards were populated, that was all rolled together to create what we now refer to as the AWP concierge. The concierge should be looked at as a central hub of information. And in that central hub of information, we've brought together the 58 AWP barriers that we identified in phase one of our research. These barriers encompass issues from pre-implementation all the way through commissioning and startup. Those 58 barriers were supported by 57 documents that we identified that we felt addressed those 58 barriers. As I mentioned earlier, these resources included both CII and non-CII publications and were things that were available in industry that could be used to overcome the barriers. As we put all of that together, the AWP concierge has over 500 potential solutions. And while that may sound a little unwieldy to approach, I think you'll find that the tool that we've developed makes approaching that very simple. So now that we've shown you our research has gathered over 500 potential solutions, let's introduce you to the AWP concierge, the tool you can use for gathering all of that. To do that, I'd like to turn you over to Robin Mickelson with ConstructX, who will walk you through the concierge. Robin? Thank you very much, Chuck. And I am very proud to hold down the last position here with the ability to actually show you the AWP concierge and walk you through its functions and its features. Um, we're very proud of this tool. We've spent a lot of time researching and identifying the different case studies as well as research documentation that would be very helpful to the industry to help further your AWP maturity um, and help guide you through that AWP implementation. And if you're brand new to help answer that question of, uh, I wanna do this, uh, where do I start? So when you first enter the concierge, a couple things that you're going to be greeted with is some housekeeping, if you will, the introduction that's going to walk you through the basic six sections and tell you what each of them's for and what the purpose of each of those particular areas are. Uh, introduction to start with that we're talking about now, integrated advanced work packaging flowchart that we're going to see in just a minute, list of barriers by implementation step, the barrier cards that Chuck, Chuck was talking about a little while ago, and summary, summary of the barriers by topic, as well as the list of references for the research that's cited as the potential uses to um, help diffuse that particular barrier that you're experiencing. The next section is the how do you use it. There's um, information on how you navigate the concierge. Uh, it is an Adobe PDF, but it is built to function and, and basically display as software, if you will, giving you selection criteria and different areas to drill down into the large amount of information that you're accessing uh, from this document and help guide you to that specific information. The flow chart is the pivotal cornerstone of navigation for the uh, AWP concierge. I'm sure to many of you, this particular flowchart and timeline looks very, very familiar. That's because it's based on the original 272 
flowchart and is being used here to help guide you through your navigation of the AWP concierge. By simply clicking on an area such as project definition in this example, we are taken then to the project barrier list for that particular area. So out of the different assortment of project barriers that have been identified within this area, you can select ones that pertain to your area of inquiry at this particular time. That will then take you to that barrier card, that barrier card that Chuck was talking about. The most important information on this card is the potential solutions in the middle. That's what we're all here about, is finding potential solutions to our barriers. These quick notes on all the different areas that you may want to try or items that will help alleviate the pain of that particular barrier are noted in the center of the particular card. You'll notice also above the arrows pointing above that give you the ability to actually see the different areas that this particular barrier would be um, tied to or complementary of as well within that particular area. You'll notice also on the bottom that that is the industry perception. So this barrier and all that's listed here, how did this pertain and how is it seen by different owners and contractors within the list of potential barriers. And you can see that this particular one that we've selected here would list, was listed within high maturity companies as a number one. Now, of course, within the middle, supporting documentation to support each of these particular methods that are shown within the center here um, is available. And of course, it's hyperlinked so that it's very, very easy for you to navigate to these specific areas. Each of these hyperlinks takes you to a document, sometimes to the specific spot within the document, or to a presentation that's going to give you that information that you need to bring back to your company to overcome that barrier, or in many cases, if you're using this proactively, to avoid running into those particular barriers at the, this particular stage of the project. Now, of course, all of this information um, has references in the back so that you can see where it came from, where it was produced, what information is cited within this, and the references for uh, clearing this particular barrier. Very important information, a lot of data as far as the different areas and the different research that was brought forward and scoured to identify how to remove the barriers that are specific to you in this particular instance. There are internal references. Of course, the internal references are those that pertain to information directly stored within CII. So CII research teams, all of our RTs, all of the IRs that we have labored over in the past are shown within the internal references. The external references show the vast amount of industry knowledge that is out there. There's been AWP conferences now for several years. There's been many practitioners and owners that have been blazing a trail within AWP. And we feel it's extremely important to go beyond just the CII research and into the field um, of study for this particular area from all of the different people who have been practitioners now for several years to get their information and their feedback, which is within the external references. Now, rather than continue with slides, I'd love to take you through a live demo now so that you can actually see the tool in action and how it can actually take you through how to clear or even avoid those barriers. All right, so I've opened the AWP Concierge, and as you can see, it opens very quickly. Um, it is a PDF-based tool, meaning that any computer with Adobe is going to give you access to be able to use the tool. Because it's an Adobe PDF, we have maintained the standard uh, Adobe tools, such as the page thumbnails on the left-hand side. Uh, if you go through for quick navigation, it'll take you through the different areas. The first several slides here, just as mentioned earlier, will take you through how to use the tool. And you can access that here quite easily um, and how to interpret the nomenclature that's used within the barrier cards also is within here. All right, we've also maintained bookmarks on the left-hand side for quick and easy access. However, we truly believe that we have created a really great workflow that you're going to choose to use um, to navigate the basis. At any point, if you click flowchart, it's going to take you to that very famous flowchart that you've seen a million times within 272, and this is actually live. So based on where you are in your project or where in the project timeline you need to ask the question for, if you will, such as stage one project definition, you click on that.
That brings up the most common barriers that have been brought forward during our research in this particular area. So if we look, go down the list, say we're having problems with cost to implement. So there's a lot of barriers to that, the perceived cost of implementation and such around this. So if you look, the way this is set up, and this is the, now the barrier card, across the top, these arrows show you where this particular barrier is most prevalent. So where this is most prevalent is in the early stages of a project. Across the bottom is the industry perception. Shows you the higher maturity companies rank this about 54th uh, within the, the list of the, of the barriers. Okay, in the middle, of course, is the suggested, suggested basis for overcoming uh, these barriers, right? Clicking on supporting documents now takes us to the massive amount of information and supporting research for this. These blue areas are all hyperlinks to take you to these particular publications and the areas within these publications that's going to give you information on how to overcome the barrier of cost to implement. Several of these have continuations to next page. If you click that, you'll see there's further. These are some of those external references now that we talked about earlier. Company presentations. So these are presentations over the years at several different conferences and such. Let's click on this one here. We'll see, and this will load up. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna pull up and load the actual presentation given by Shell at the uh, conference in London. So this, um, is the actual presentation given from the main stage. Within here is the information on cost to implement and how to overcome some of those barriers, as there is in multiple other different uh, presentations. Gives you quick access at your fingertips to those multiple different uh, resources that are very, very helpful um, in overcoming these barriers and making your experience with the tool very, very simple. Now, not all of them are quite as straightforward. If we go to IWP-based um, controls barrier list, if we go to something like internal pushback, there's a big one. Lots of internal pushback often, not my, not my department, don't move my cheese and such. Internal pushback. Now looking at this, you can see across the top, every section has an arrow attributed to it, meaning it's tying to every particular section of a project you will experience or could experience some potential pushback. This being such a large area has multiple different pages of potential resolutions. Industry perceptions, because there are so many different areas, are sectioned by role so that you can see within an organization based on role where they actually uh, sit. And then supporting documents. All right. Now, of course, the supporting documents, being it is such a large one, there's a massive amount of supporting documents as well. Continuing to the next page, you can see there are a large amount. Lots of presentations on overcoming internal, internal pushback. Again, to guide you through how it is you're going to successfully implement AWP and how to overcome barriers to become more successful with your AWP implementation. Well, I bet you're asking yourself, what should you do now? Well, with the RT365 findings and the deliverables that we've provided you through the AWP concierge, we feel we've built a great tool to assist you in creating your business cases and assisting in making your AWP implementations as productive as possible. The AWP concierge is a tool that provides easier access to the AWP resources. That's key. Those, AWP resources, there's a large amount of them in the industry, but for a very long time, they've been difficult to access or be able to locate. Now it's, ex it's as easy as just clicking on a hyperlink to be able to get that information. This helps overcome those AWP implementation barriers, finding that information for that business case, finding that information to answer that difficult question, you know, and supporting AWP implementation efforts through the life cycle of that project. Because really, as you're going through that project, you're going to have questions. You need a confidant to ask confidant. and to get answers from. We feel that the AWP concierge is the starting point for this. The AWP concierge is a window into the CII AWP knowledge base like you've never had before. Now, of course, there needs to be a call to action. 
Please use the AWP concierge to overcome your barriers. Use it as the tool that is your go-to to find that information that's difficult. Use it as your window to the industry to be able to identify how to better implement AWP. And please work with CII, work with the AWP CBA to give us feedback on the tool and continue to evolve it. It's incredibly important that we get industry feedback to make these things better. Work with the CBA to do this. The vision for the future is AWP's importance in the digital environment will continue to grow. We're going to improve the availability, traceability of project planning and control information. You're going to see such things in the future as AI, artificial intelligence, tied to AWP for better automated project planning and proactive project resolutions. There's projects coming for that. There's development and research underway. It's going to be a great future. I've had the distinct pleasure over the last two years to work with an amazing team. This team has taken this research to next levels, created an amazing tool to be able to bring you on a silver platter the information of the industry around AWP and make it so easy to access. I believe that uh, this team has done amazing things. I thank you for joining us here today. It is my pleasure to have been presenting to you and I hope that you love and use the AWP concierge. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, just a reminder, remember, feel free to enter your questions in the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And we have some questions to get started with here. Um, I'll go to Mark Lambert first on this. The original CII AWP research was completed several years ago. In your opinion, what is the main reason that more companies have not fully adopted it? Hey, thank you, Mike. That's a great question, and it's one that our team talked quite a bit about. Uh, I think part of it is uh, when you're implementing AWP, you're potentially touching every aspect of your project delivery system. So it can be quite overwhelming to think I'm going to potentially disrupt, you know, a working uh, good project delivery program and touch every phase of it. So that's a little bit scary. and. Uh, I think what has helped over the last few years is the idea of scalability, that I can step into the different aspects of advanced work packaging and uh, grow my program while I'm continuing to execute my projects. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Michael King, let's go to you with this one. Advanced work packaging seems to touch on the entire project life cycle. What did the team discover about e what effective training and support looks like for such an effort? Uh, thank you for that. You know, just that a training program that includes both general and role-based content um, with some specific project examples is a good start. The program should give an, give an understanding for the organization's general approach to advanced work packaging implementation and identify some specific processes and deliverables that have changed um, you know since the last project implementation to ensure that each team member fully understands how awp uh, affects their work okay thanks uh would anybody like to Add on to that. Okay. Um, just to let everybody know in the chat box, uh, Jenny BN just posted the link to the okay. AWP concierge. So that's the link to our knowledge base, and you can download the uh, concierge tool there. Um, okay. We have two very similar questions. One, how much, if any, data is available for AWP with very small projects, say 10 million or less? And the other one is any benefits to implement AWP on smaller, less than 25 million brownfield projects? Um, 
Robin Mickelson, would you like to take that one? Sure, I definitely can. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so when it comes to implementing on smaller programmatic approaches, um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mark to follow up on on my answer, as that he I believe him to be an expert in in scalability as well um, for these. But one thing that I want to bring up when it comes to smaller portfolios and and uh, bringing forth this into an environment of multiple projects that may be smaller is to review some of the scalability information and documentation that's been created both from COA and CII moving forward. Uh, there's some great tools in there for identifying uh, project scalability purpose and, and methodologies. Um, when implementing AWP across a program, it's important to understand that, you know, pick a, pick a pilot project and implement your uh, AWP methodologies on that as you move forward into the rest of the program. Um, that'll help spread out the, the cost of implementation as well as ensure that you've got a certain amount of information required as you move forward um, in understanding the scalability of your, your implementation. Uh, Mark, you got anything to add? Hey, thanks, Robin. I, I appreciate those questions and that is particularly the world that I live in in most of our projects at Eastman. We do a lot of brownfield construction and a lot of smaller projects as the industry would count uh, large versus small projects. So I think we've decided that the, you know, the principles of better planning, uh, better organization, you know, better team engagement during front end loading, all those things that would benefit a mega project still apply to the smaller project. So the same principles, although the techniques might vary and uh, particularly like Robin mentioned, uh, reference that COA scalability document, very good reference for smaller projects. Hey, Mike and Mark, could I add to that? Yes, Absolutely. please. So thanks for bringing up the principles there, uh, Mark. You know, for someone who's really looking at the smaller projects, I would encourage them to, first of all, see uh, AWP in the way that Dr. Bill O'Brien describes it as a structure, uh, a framework, uh, that's very appropriate for helping us to develop a project in a way that it will stay healthy. And we can assess it as we go relative to its wellness. And if you think then, what are the key fundamentals that apply even to the smaller project scopes? You could say, for example, AWP is about aligning on the sequence. So in other words, engineering, construction, procurement, you know, project controls, everyone aligning on the sequence. Then looking at the timing of deliverables being issued to fit that sequence and holding, holding ourselves to that timing. Then it's about constraint management. And then improving as necessary, the field work packs so that you have that, that foreman, that leadership staying at the work face with the workers mentoring, coaching, leading the crews, and therefore also capturing the safety benefits that comes from being more organized, having more unknowns and fewer unknowns at the work phase. So you can look at what are those key fundamentals that apply regardless of project size, and then make it fit for purpose. And that's about the scalability, and it works. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. I have a couple of questions related to engineering. Um, and Neil, let's go to you first on these. One is, how has AWP and EWP worked to improve timing of 3D model drafting efforts? Have we seen 3D models being delivered ahead of the planned completion targets? And the other one is, are there any best practices that design engineering contractors can follow to deploy AWP? Sure. Thanks for the question. With regards to the physicalization or the development of the 3D model, bringing in those construction coordinators that are conveying the path of construction and making sure that the, that the designers are actually producing the model and the deliverables associated to that model in the sequence of that path of construction has led to the deliberate release that supports the overall project. So I've seen, I've seen where we haven't been uh, changing priority on our engineering teams by having that sync up between the EWPs 
and IWPs. Now, um, uh, Mike, on uh, second question, please. Yes. Um, are there any best practices that design engineering contractors can follow to deploy AWP? Yeah. So having the data, so, so having the arrangement between your whoever's going to receive the data, having the arrangement on the data structure, the nomenclature, the format, having that prearranged is is a best practice. I know that uh, CI is working to develop that. So leveraging that as it's developed would would certainly be uh, a benefit. Uh, for us, you know, our experience has been that once we've normalized that information that we expect to receive from our design teams or engineering teams, uh, it really facilitates the automation that really multiplies uh, the effect of AWP on our project. So, so having that data contract, that data structure established uh, goes a long way. Thanks a lot, Neil. Okay, um, Mike. Mike, I, yeah, I think we can comment as well. I think on what what can be a best practice. I don't think industry has has had the opportunity yet to put it into wide practice. But if you look in the concierge, at the particular challenge or barrier that's around design engineering, that the design engineering organization is not as supportive of AWP as you would like to see. If you look at that particular barrier, you'll see that what we have listed as some of the potential solutions include developing and training an AWP champion within the design engineering organization to help drive the AWP approach. And when you look at that, I think that has the potential to be an aspect of a best practice in the engineering phase. And what you want to do is not just look at that at the surface level and say, okay, so we'll have an AWP champion at, in the engineering phase, but continue to dig into that. Think deeply about what does that mean? It, someone who is appropriately trained, that they have the right influence, that they're positioned in the organization appropriately to be able to have influence across disciplines at that phase of the project. So there's more to it than just having a champion. Are they the right kind of, you know, are they the right sort of leader for the role? And you'll also see as well in the concierge that we have a barrier called lack of AWP champion slash leadership. It's another place to go as you're trying to explore, well, what more did the research team have to say about effective leadership and, and championing of an AWP project? Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Let me come back to you with this question. Um, Marcelo says, great study and presentation. I'm in the owner side upstream, and we see important barriers in our supply chain to implement AWP. As AWP is stronger in the downstream industry where normally projects have multiple contracts, do you think AWP is more fit for that situation than for where you have a single EPC or a turnkey contract? I'd say it's just as well fit for the upstream. Uh, but again, that fit for purpose concept applies. Uh, AWP provides and encourages a more collaborative, integrated approach of bringing the stakeholders into the project early enough so that you're getting more effective benefit from the collaboration. Uh, you're getting more effective constructability input at the right time. Uh, there are various, the, the clarity around when the suppliers actually have to deliver in order for the project to stay in sequence. All of this becomes more clear it typically in an AWP type project. So whether it's uh, fewer suppliers or whether it's maybe maybe not as complex from a brownfield standpoint or whatever, it's still those fundamentals apply. There's no question about it. So upstream, downstream as well, though I agree, it's, it's probably had more application now over the years in downstream projects. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Robin, uh, what is the relationship between work packaging or work packages and the WBS structure? Great question. So um, I think it's very important when setting up your WBS structure to understand that um, your project schedule is going to be affected by the structure of your work packages, meaning understanding that hierarchy, the CWA, the CWP, the CWP typically tied to your level three activity is, is the kind of the rule of thumb on that. 
the IWPs being possibly an activity under the CWP, but not really a logic driven activity because they can cause schedules to collapse. But understanding how the WBS structure needs to be changed or needs to be renamed often is all it is uh, to follow the AWP uh, hierarchy and package relationship, if you will, is very key, key Sorry, in setting up your WBS structure. So working with those Primavera operators and such to, to understand the, how to modify corporate templates and get them set up to acknowledge the existence of AWP, if you will, um, is highly important uh, because often when I when I go in to assist with projects, I see it all the time where they're doing great things with AWP, but they're fighting their schedule because the schedule is not set up uh, to accommodate the breakdown that AWP brings forward into the project environment. Thanks, great. Mike. You bet. Thanks. Um, Mark, let's go to you with this question first, um, and we'll let others chime in. But for those on the panel who have implemented AWP, what was the biggest lesson learned? What would you do differently if you were starting again? Hey, thank you, Mike. Uh, I think like we had mentioned earlier, my experience has been when you're implementing advanced work packaging, the cultural change is significant. And uh, it, it took me aback when we first uh, started our first implementations and just the sheer amount of change and uh, not everyone is on board with that level and it's di difficult and it just takes continuous encouragement and uh, proving the benefits. I think you see a lot of folks in your project delivery systems that, you know, it's that old story of uh, good is the enemy of great. You know, they have a practice that has been very successful and it's they're reluctant to change so that's a tough one i think the encouraging side is even on early implementations and even on not fully mature programs you can see the benefits and you can see safety benefits and productivity even on those very early projects okay great um would anybody else like to respond to that question I'll add two, two points, Mike. Uh, one would be to look carefully at the training program that would take place, um, training of individuals on a project team, uh, taking that training down to, you know, to, for the most part, all levels. Um, previous, this is interesting, previous CII research showed that if you take uh, foremen, for example, leaders on a project team, and you train them in AWP, even if your project does not actually apply AWP, but those field leaders have been trained in what AWP is about, then they tend to perform in a way that's more closely connected to what the expectations are for their role. In other words, they spend more time at the work base. So just the training in the fundamentals of AWP helps reorient an individual toward the importance of their role relative to safety, leadership, uh, keeping keeping the organization functioning well. So I think looking at not stopping short in the area of training across the project team and disciplines would be important. The other is to continue to bring in the, the concepts of flexibility, scalability, and fit for purpose so that individuals don't become too, let's say, digital in how they may want to apply a concept and maybe overdo it in a certain way or maybe maybe not optimize the way they can do it. But that takes some time, typically, I think, in understanding and applying the AWP fundamentals to develop a good sense for that flexibility and scalability again. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, you will receive a short survey from CII uh, in, the email, in your email. Please fill that out for us so we get your feedback for this session. And thank you all very much for joining us. We appreciate your time and we hope that you found the webinar useful. I'd like to thank the research team very much for your informative presentation and great question and answer session. Don't forget to uh, check out our events page to sign up for future webinars. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.